didn't have data. Um, and today we're going to go through and talk about what happens when we want to do nonlinear regression. Uh, and we're also going to talk about the Bayesian case. If we have time, we'll get to sparse linear. But our goal, in particular for today's lab, is to make sure that we can do nonlinear regression uh, since, that, since that's what it calls for. When we were uh, finishing up our Bayesian version, we said, OK, based on our prior, that we want to find. Those are our parameters that get multiplied by our data. We want those to be ideally small, but we have a lot of uncertainty about them. We ended up coming up with this closed form distribution for our phi's. So I'm just flagging this so that you remember, because we're going to be using a very similar equation uh, in just a moment. But the idea was we get a closed form solution for that. And once we have our parameters at training time, then we can perform inference where we again can say there's a normal distribution on our world state. So we don't come up with a single answer, we come up with a distribution for W star. If you recall this equation or you don't, that's okay. The point of it is it's a Gaussian where we have a mean and a variance. And if I hand you training data X and I hand you training data W, and I ask you for this test X, X star, so right here, can you calculate what is W star? The answer is you should be able to, right? You can always look back at the notes and see that we can do that. All right, so I'm just refreshing this in your mind because we're going to be using this now when we go into nonlinear regression. Okay, so we have some data and we have some training examples of data with the world state. We are going to do nonlinear regression by doing linear regression on some transformed version of the data. So we're going to take our data, which we agree doesn't necessarily live in a linear space. We're going to transform it, and I'll tell you in a moment how. And then we're going to just repeat the process we'd seen on Tuesday for doing linear regression. Okay, so if you've got linear regression on Tuesday, you're going to see the same thing applied again, but now it's going to be even more powerful. Previously, when we did linear regression, we said, right, we want to know probability of the world state given our data and some parameters. And we were doing that as a normal distribution. Do you remember this trick? What did we do to x before we could write it in this linear form? So appended a 1 to it. That way, there's a 1 at the beginning of this that gets multiplied by element phi 0. Phi 0 was just this y offset, right? The y intercept. So the rest of the phi's are slopes, um, or you could think of them as weighting parameters for, uh, for each of these elements of the data vector x. Yeah? The adding of the 1, is that called the bias sometimes? I've heard that term used. Uh, it's similar. I, I it would depend on the context. Okay. It is uh, sometimes in the context I've heard of, it, I've heard it referred to as a, an offset, like a DC offset, okay. um, or it could be a bias, I suppose. Right, okay. yeah. In the context of neural networks as well, I've heard it used as a yes. describe the bias. That's right. Okay. So, you, and, and we're going to see a visual illustration of that. If you, don't, if you don't know what we're talking about, you will see a visual illustration of that in just a few slides. So this is recap, right? This is review. We just talked about, hey, I've got a closed form solution for it for uh, maximum likelihood. And we just showed a slide where we have a closed form solution for it for the Bayesian approach as well. Okay. And now the nonlinear regression equation looks almost exactly the same, with the difference being that we've got a z here. And z instead of an x. Now z is just going to be some function of x. So we're going to make up, we're going to pick a function out of a bag. It's a very special bag because well, not everything uh, is allowed in the bag. We're going to pick a function out of the bag and we're going to apply that function to every one of our vectors x. And whatever, whatever comes out of that function, we write that down 
in this z vector in place of where the x elements were. And then when we do that, we get to apply the same procedure that we did for linear regression, only now it's called nonlinear regression because of, because of what we did to z. All right, so we're going to illustrate that now. The polynomial regression, right, which is clearly nonlinear, right, because we've got phi 0 times, it, times 1, and we have phi 1 times the data xi. But we also are adding on these elements, these, these products of x squared with something and x cubed with something, and we can keep going to higher order. So this is our, our polynomial function of order 3, clearly nonlinear. Right? And we could say, well, we could represent that in the form we've just mentioned by saying, all right, I'm going to define z. Z is going to be, um, z is going to look like this. It's going to have a 1 at the front, and it's going to have x in the first, in the, well, that's the zeroth element in the first slot. In the second slot, it's going to have x squared, and in the third slot, it's going to have x cubed. So we've, we've applied this function to x, and that's the z that's sitting here. With z looking that way, or however we define our z function, we can now compute a maximum likelihood vector for phi, phi hat. Now this, if you recall, or you look back at your notes that you have in front of you, you might see that when we were dealing with, with x's, this was x, x transpose inverted times x times w. Always capital Z or capital X because we're talking about one data point or many data points? Many data points, right? So the, the sleight of hand here, which was sort of not intentional, is that this is zi little vector z. We're just talking about data point i, xi. But we can stack them all together just like we did, just like we did our x's. Remember we said this is xi, that x1, this is x2, right? Da, da, da. And we said, all right, this is i, uh, sorry, this is i wide. And how tall is it? D. D, as we said, is d-dimensional. So each x vector has d dimensions. Well, we're doing the same thing now, only we're going to have z's here. So it's still going to be d by d by i. But um, this d can now change because we said, oh well, let's have third order or let's have fifth order, right? So we can change how complex z is by adding more terms to it, making our z, our function of x, more complicated. All right. So the maximum likelihood solution turns out to be computable. If you knew how to compute it when we were just dealing with x's, you would still know how to compute it. It's essentially the same formula. All right. So now, what does it look like when we when we use this um, this wonderful technique? All right. So uh, I'm going to ask you to selectively look at this picture. Ignore the red curve for now. We'll, we'll, that's our answer. We'll get to that at the end. Um, instead, just look at the blue dots. These are our training pairs. That's, that's a x, input x, paired with its known output w. Okay, and we have a whole bunch of these blue dots, and that's our training data. All right, so I've given you a big part of what you need. Now I've said, ah, we're going to do this nonlinear regression by applying our linear regression technique to some function of x, right? So the function of x, we're going to say, OK, instead of polynomial regression, we're going to do this other trick. We're going to do radial basis regression. <coughs> OK, so radial basis regression, um, we can use any, um, just about any kind of uh, symmetric e equation. Here we're using a Gaussian, and we're saying, all right, 
I'm going to fill in the slots of z. The first slot, I'm just going to make it a 1. So this is our offset term. So you should see a black line here. We're going to use these in just a moment, OK? First, we're just going to set up what's the relationship between z and x. We know z is some function of x. And I'm saying, well, the first slot here is just going to be a constant 1. This slot, I'm going to feed in my x sub i. So that's where, where my, one, my univariate input goes. And I'm going to have this term alpha 1. So this is a, this is a Gaussian shifted by alpha 1 and scaled by lambda. All right, so if we go over and look at z1, there it is. It's this blue curve that looks like, looks like that. So what's happening, the alpha, uh, alpha 1, has shifted it to this location. And the lambda term is scaling it how tall it should be, right? So you see it's kind of going almost towards, uh, towards 2 there. All right, so that's my, that's my z, let's see, my second entry of z. My third entry of z is going to be just like the previous one, but I'm going to shift it by a different amount. And I'm going to keep the scaling factor the same. Okay, now, what I'm presenting here are somewhat arbitrary choices. I could be doing radial basis regression, and I could choose to implement these things differently. I could make try to make the alphas all the same. I could try to make the, the lambdas all different if I wanted to. It's just going to be more or less, more or fewer parameters depending on the choices I make. You'll see in a moment that there's a there's a, a good reason or a practical reason rather than a theoretical. There's a practical reason why we're shifting by different amounts: alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. I'm reading this off in case the back rows. Can you guys see that this is alpha three? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So we've got uh, alpha one through alpha six, and so what you should see is that was what happens with z one. The green one is Z2, Z3, Z4. All right, so now I've set up this family of functions. These are the outputs of this family when I apply different values of x. So the x-axis is varying here. But if I plug in a specific x sub i, right, then I'll just be, I pick uh, x right here, right, then I'll be able to calculate it its value according to the blue curve, its value according to the green curve, and so on. So I'll have I'll have an entry for each of these slots. Yes? It says Z1 uh, from depending on X. Shouldn't that be X in the B graph? Z1 X. Z1 X. of X. Z1 is a function of X. Yeah, isn't that actually X I? No, because if I did Z1 as a function of X I, it would be a single point. Z1. It, it, let me let me standardize my notation here a little bit. That's going to be called, we'll call that Z0. That's Z1, Z2, Z3. Z1 is set up as a formula, which we can implement in MATLAB and say, all right, I'm going to dial in a specific value for alpha 1, a specific value for lambda. And now what we're discussing is, what about the x? the x sub i here. If I plug in a single x sub i, the, the, let's call it the third training example, x sub 3. Okay. If I plug in x sub 3 here, then I will evaluate this, this Gaussian for a single point, and I will get a single real number out. So for x sub 3 equals, what, what do you want it to be, uh, 0.8? Yeah, is that good? We'll say x sub 3 equals 0.8. So we go here. If this is 0, this is 1, let's say. Uh, we'll go to 0.8, and we'll see, all right, what is the value of z1 when I evaluate it at 0.8? And it'll be some height. OK, so it's not 0, but because it's this blue curve, it's very close to 0. z, z, whatever. 5 is maybe quite high at x3 equals 0.8. Yeah? Okay, so you actually call Z3 the fourth line in that matrix and not the whole thing. Indeed. Z3, I'm calling 
Uh, right. I see now you're you're correcting a a notation problem on the graph and not not a misunderstanding. I don't know. I, I'm just going to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think that's fair. Yes. All right. So I think I think you you you're right, and I need to fix uh, fix the graph. Make a note, and let me then explain what is the uh, what is the problem, so everyone else can see it. Okay. So this we have. Uh, can I can I try first, and then if it's still unclear, okay. Indeed, you're going to have um, for each x sub i, you're going to compute a vector z sub i. It's going to be a vector of numbers. It's going to be the response of plugging in x sub i into this line, plugging in x sub i into this line, x sub i into each of these lines. So z, if we're plugging in x sub 3, then z sub 3 would be this vector of numbers. And the problem is that here, we're, we've, rep, we've abused notation very badly, right? And so I apologize for that. And so z sub 4 should probably be more like um, z um, uh, how to do this? z of z evaluating x but we want the third element, um, or the fourth element. Uh, so I'm trying to think of a nice way of representing that. So maybe something like this to say this should be, uh, or no, the, the pink one is four, right? So what I'm trying to get at is I want to know what would happen if I looked at just the fourth line of this plugging in a specific x or plugging in a range of x's. Are we are we in agreement then? All right. Does that clear things up? I think so. So it's not the first element of xi going in the second element of zi. It's all of the elements of xi. xi is a single scalar. It's lowercase. It's not bolded. It is a single number. We had, we had agreed implicitly a moment ago we're going to call it point 0.8 for now. We've right. got a number that comes along and says I'm point 0.8. So for a given for a given data point x fold. Uh, x, our data points here are still one dimensional. Okay. Our, you, you have a choice of data points. You can choose anything you want, but it's only going to be a one dimensional real value from some minimum between some minimum and some maximum, or you can. Okay, sorry, I thought I thought we were still having multi-dimensional. No, we're doing it. Uh, we're doing a single-dimensional x, so that um, we can plot it nicely in in these sort of two D graphs, the relationship between x and the world w. So the, our inputs are one-dimensional, and our outputs are one-dimensional. The confusing thing that I want to that I, I don't want you to lose track of is that while I'm so while I'm putting in a, a, un, a one-dimensional x, the radial basis function is going to make uh, what is that seven versions of it. It's going to say, well, you know, I I like your x, but I'm going to see how this function responds to your x. And I'm going to see how this function responds to your x, and how this one responds to your x. So this this array, this maybe is misleading. We should just throw away that. Back. This this array is saying, I want to know. I'm going to convert your one-dimensional input into a seven-dimensional intermediate representation. Yeah. Question. Uh, his question was first. Sorry. It's not the question. Perhaps 
Yeah, I think that would be a that would be a fine a fine alternative representation. So uh, we will uh, I will we fix the graph. A two-dimensional, essentially. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Said, it, its i will be one point. That's right. Okay, for some x i. If it's wrong, it will be one point. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say so. Okay, great. So if we if we like that sort of representation better, right? We could say, all right, we're still going to evaluate z of our x's. Um, we're going to do it for a certain i, and we can evaluate sort of which row we're we're dealing with. So if I'm trying to plot this this magenta one, I might be talking about i comma four, right? And then um, I can plug in. I can plug in different values. Oh, sorry. So that I down. Should I make this bigger? We could try the MATLAB notation. We could do MATLAB notation. Listen, I don't want to spend the whole time uh, <laughs> revising this. What I want to show here is that I comma four of. Well, that's just focus, isn't it? Um, Z of x i. X i goes in. Z i comes out. Zi is multi-dimensional, right? We can talk about its zeroth element, or its first, or second, or third, or fourth, or fifth, up to seventh in this case. Z sub i comma zero. Does it actually depend on x in this case? Not heads yes or not heads no. So I can see that at the seventh. Okay. I'm seeing only two heads nodding. Does that mean I've lost everyone else? Let's try again. For the zeroth element here, zero there, does it depend on x? Seeing, okay, so more heads nodding no, that's correct. Why not? Because we said, oh, it's just constant. It's just one. All right? So we've got a one. We've got, z, that's, that's called that z0, z0. We have z1, z2, z3, z4. Slight abuse of notation. Okay, we'll fix that. And now we're saying that if, given this blue data set, corresponding with the, we know the corresponding inputs and their outputs, we wish that we could adjust our phi's, our weights. Remember our weights, they were weighting the different dimensions of x previously. Now they're going to weight our different dimensions of z. They're going to say, well, I think maybe this one's more important and this one's less important. We want our, our phi's have this freedom. They're going to go up or down to try to weight the different dimensions so that when we add them all up together, they go through all the data points. So that's what you're seeing here after we've optimized the phi's. So we can do a, we can do a maximum likelihood estimate of phi's. Yeah. So we can compute the phi's, the weights that give us the best match. And this is what it looks like when you take z i comma 1 right, and weight it by phi 1. It looks like a little blip here at the beginning, and then it goes down. The same thing. So each of these colors has now been transferred here with its appropriate weight. So you can see that phi 4, right, the weight phi 4 is quite big because compared to the others, because now it's this big bump, whereas the others have all kind of shrunken down. Some of them have even gone down. They've gone negative, right? So obviously phi has chosen to be a negative value there. So instead of sort of being a bump up, it's a bump downwards. What happened to the black line? It is, but what, what happened to it? C0 is here, it shifted down. So the parameter phi 0 said, oh, actually, I'd like to slide you down. If I slide you down, it's trying to control all these sliders at once. It says, if I slide you down and I slide these other parameters, phi 1, phi 4, all the others up and down a little bit, I can come up with this nice combination so that when I put in one of the training data points at some value of x, and I compute 
the product of phi 1, z1, and phi 2, z1, all for the same data point, and I add them all up, we'll end up with a line, the line going either through that data point or very close to it. So if you, if you keep in mind that we're modeling this as a normal distribution, so our probability of w given x is going to be a Gaussian at every, at every input x, then you'll see why this looks like a Gaussian. Only now its shape is trying to go through all the data points. The mean of the Gaussian, so we could look at we, each vertical slice of this is a Gaussian. Each vertical slice, because we fixed sigma squared, we fixed the variance, right? We, we were only estimating uh, a single variance here for everybody. Uh, if you actually take a slice out of this, it looks the same as the slice out of here, or the slice here, or the slice here. I know it doesn't look it, but uh, I've actually uh, tried it, right? I've visually looked at it. These, this slice will look the same as this thick slice here. Right? It's just perceptual. And if you take the mean of those Gaussians, you'll get this red line here. How is that? One question. Yeah. We're doing the scaling twice almost with the lambdas and the phi's at the end. What's the relationship? The lambdas are a deterministic scaling. We said we're going to put into our bag, or we're going to pull out of our bag, this family of functions. Predefined, ignores the data. You give me new training data, lambdas stay the same. But the phi is they adopt to the data. <coughs> okay. Did we have to choose radial basis functions? Did we have to choose these particular equations based on alpha 1 and lambda? No, we, we didn't have to. We can choose a different family of functions. We're, gonna, we're trying to do nonlinear regression, so all we're doing is we're projecting x into some nonlinear space. This is another nonlinear space, the arctan family of functions. So uh, they look a little bit like logistic regression, this, this curve I had described previously, right, that helps us map <coughs> values between, that go between negative infinity to infinity into the range sort of zero to one, right? That was our, that was our, um, that was our logistic regression. Here arctan has a very similar function and again it so happens lambdas affect our scaling, alphas affect our offset. So you should see again sort of the, the first element, the second element, third element, fourth element. Each, each function, this, this red curve, has a response to different values of x. So because of this made up function or fam basis functions that we've, that we've picked, we're converting our one dimensional x into a uh, seven dimensional vector of numbers. This is this intermediate representation of x, and with that intermediate representation of x, right, so each data point gets projected into a higher dimensional space, and then when we project it there, we say, you know what, could you, could you calculate some phi's for me? The weights of each of these functions that will best explain these data points. And so here again, the same thing is happening, so this was our blue curve before we scaled it, that's z1, and this is what it looks like, kind of goes up and then goes pretty flat after we've, after we've scaled it by our phi 1. So I think I, I said this very quickly, this is a scaling factor in the case of arctan that's sort of affecting the, the slope of this, um, of this shape. But again, we'd fix the lambdas all be the same, and we just were changing the alphas. That's why these are all sort of parallel to each other with slight shifts. The result, though, is that we can now take this sum of the responses of each of these functions for a given data point, and we can say, all right, for a given x value, here the, the sum of all of these basis curves adds up to 
this value here with some fixed variance. And you can comment, you can look at this figure and compare and so try to see, well, was I better off picking R10 or radial basis functions? In this case, I would probably say I favor R10. That's not the point of the, the debate, though. Um, I, I favor R10 because we don't have a lot of data here, but the radial basis function is, is actually creating this extra loop up here. Now, we don't know where this data is from. We just we have lack of data there, so this suggests that maybe you really want the Bayesian solution, right? Um, maybe you'd, you'd like to know that when you're far away from data points, you should just be very, very uncertain in that area. Okay, but depending on your data, depending on your choice of basis functions, you will get slightly different responses. Yeah? So how many is this are you summing up when x has a special value? Is that... When x is, a, what do you mean a special you value? Said, you said we pick for 0 0.3, we, we sum up the yeah. uh, z gamma Gaussians. How many are that? Is that this many? Or is that i times 7? It's, uh, it's only 7. For a given i, a given data point x, we have 7. We just look at the response of each of those, each of these seven lines to that same input x, i. Okay. If there is one point coming in, you don't have a training point. How do I know what disease for that? We're computing them deterministically here. So you you come to me and you say I, I have this new, I have a new x. It's 0.8. You say what's the what's the probability? of the world being in a given state. Tell me the distribution. What are the possible W's for x equals 0.8? And I say, well, um, OK. Let's plug in 0.8 here, 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 here. We have a seven-dimensional vector. Each of these seven dimensions gets multiplied by its corresponding phi that we learned at training time. So there's no, there's no guessing. We're just multiplying by 0 by that, by 1 times that, by 2 times that, just write them in here, add them all together, and see what w we end up with. And we would end up with w up here, or I can show it to you up here. That's the w we'd end up with. And you say, oh, but I asked for a normal distribution around that. And I'd say, fine, there you go. That's your normal distribution. Yes? Um, so other than the, uh, the fact that the function you put in the z vector has to be some Nonlinear function. Is there are any other constraints? Not really. There, there are sort of less convenient functions that we can put in, but but not not especially. No. We'll get into. We'll, we're about to to advance this another step, and then there will be constraints. Not more. Yes. Um, is there any um, standard way of choose the alphas and the lambda? We could try optimizing those as well. And because this is this this part is closed form, it wouldn't be that bad. It wouldn't be that hard. So I think I have a I think I have a slide coming up which shows what happens uh, when you choose other values of lambda. So indeed, I think I think you've you've learned the philosophy perfectly, right? When you see, you see a variable and someone says, oh well, you know, let's just fix that, right? Uh, you should be saying, well, hold on, but where did you get that number, right? And, and can you justify it? There's one more question, and then I'm going to, yeah. Uh, why seven? I mean, why not eight? It is, it, you are allowed to, this is a choice of, for you to make, although we're about to see that we can even go to sort of infinite dimensions uh, if, we, if we choose. But if you wanted to do polynomial regression with third order, polynomials, right? Then you know that you would set this to 3 plus 1, so you'd have four dimensions, right? Um, so it, it obviously helps if you know that your data is going to land in these in this range to choose sort of the minimum and maximum offset, right? The translation of these because if uh, if you if you if an x comes in that's sort of further down on the number line like up here, well then, you're projecting x into seven dimensions, but they're all basically responding in the exact same way, right? They're all giving you the same number. 
So what you want is something that's going to sort of tease them apart and say, well, I respond better to high x's, you respond better to, uh, to high x's, you respond better to low x's. Okay? So I don't want to, I don't want to dwell too long on the choice of which function, nonlinear function we're going to use. These are good options and people use them. But I want to introduce that we also have, we also can do Gaussian process regression. So now that we've seen two examples from, from the family, let's doing okay let's go on to Gaussian process so we have we've got a version we've got a way of doing this now right we're, o we're okay with that now we're going to take into account the fact that we might want to make do the Bayesian formulation we might want to keep track of our uncertainty and still do nonlinear regression. And this is going to be the Gaussian process regressor. So we're going to say that our sigma squared, which we had fixed previously, um, is learned from marginalizing the from, from the marginal likelihood. So we were saying, oh, I'm going to estimate my parameters, just my phi's, my weights. And then when I'm done with that, and I have a Bayesian solution, then I can come back and do some kind of nonlinear search for what are good sigmas. Now, we've done that for the Bayesian formulation. It looked like this. This was the solution for the Bayesian formulation. This is just a repeat of a slide we saw on Tuesday. Okay, But that was with x's. And I've just introduced that there's a way to convert our x's into z's. So that's what that's what we're saying here. So for our Bayesian approach to nonlinear regression, ta-da, you've just learned you've just learned it, right? You you already knew it before, but but you just didn't realize that by plugging in the z's instead of the x's, you can do you can find your prediction for what is the distribution on some new w given some input z star, which is actually an input x star, right, but wrapped up, projected through this nonlinear family of functions. OK, so this isn't surprising, right? This is OK? All right, so really it's just, you're just supposed to see, oh yeah, OK. That's the same, all the, all the x's have changed into z's. All right. When we do that, we're going to illustrate it, but we're going to go slightly in a, in a funny way now. So we're going to still have our training inputs, x, and our training outputs, w. We use those to fit our parameters. Except, remember, this is the Bayesian approach. So we actually have a distribution over our phi's. We're saying, no, there's not a single phi 0 and a single phi 1. Right? There is going to be a distribution. And we favor big phi's or little phi's, do you remember? Big or little? Little phi's. We said we prefer little phi's because we like smaller weights. We're saying, uh, in general, if you can get away with sort of smaller variations, that's a simpler explanation of, of, the, of the situation. So if I sample in that space of phi's, I just say, uh, you know, let's pick some highly probable phi's, but not all the same one. We won't pick the maximum one. We'll just pick some combination of phi 0, phi 1, uh, phi 2, and I think this is uh, phi 1 through phi 7. It's the same setup that we had before with the radial basis functions. <coughs> Every time I pick a different combination of phi's, I'll end up with a different solution, a different red curve that's fitting through all the training data. Some of them are, based on the prior, are more likely than others. Remember, because we said certain combinations of phi's are better than others. So if we weight these different solutions based on their, their prior value, based on their, uh, the, the probability of that particular parameter combination, you end up with this result. So this should look very similar to the radial basis function result that we had, 
except that now we don't have a fixed variance. And you can see that right here where there's less data because now it gets more spread out. So if I can switch back and forth, try to remember that picture versus that picture. Yeah? So overall, in, in various places, the, the confidence should be sort of more distributed now that I go, go here again. Because I have a distribution for my phi's, I can't show you the single graph of, what was I using before? I was using the, the, the sort of magenta one. I can't show you a single curve that says, oh, this is phi, this is z sub i comma 4 of x, because that would be choosing a single a single choice of phi's, right? And instead, it's actually a distribution on phi's. And so that's why what we can do here is just plot the mean of that distribution. And say, all right, well, in general, the, the, if you keep sampling and, and, and taking weighted samples of your different phi's, this is what Z4 is going to be weighted as. But otherwise, you, you should be seeing, you should understand the similarity between this graph and and the previous sets of graphs, right, where we're saying, yeah, I got a bunch of basis functions, predefined them, and I've trained on some training data. I have weights now that I calculated, phi's, and based on that, I can now make this predictive distribution. It's going to predict for any new test x that I put in, what is the probability of w? All right, but this is the Bayesian solution now, not the maximum likelihood, because we're keeping track that we're uncertain about our finds. Which is nice, right? It says, um, yeah, it's kind of blurry here. That's, that's good. Okay. Now, the kernel trick. You might have heard of it before. Uh, it's very handy. We've just seen this equation, right? In this equation, um, Okay, admittedly, we replaced all the x's by z. All right, that's, yeah, so that was intentional. Uh, but the other thing you might see is that none of the z's is by itself. Every z is paired with another z. So here you have big z's, remember, are all the data, all the training data, right? Little z's, in this case, all the little z's are star, right? So that's the, the test, the test observation x run through this, this response family z. But every z is paired next to another z. This one, this one, this one, this one. These are all paired together. So it's completely legitimate. Everything I've told you, people do it, people use it, and it's, it's frequently the right answer. You take your x's, you pass them to a function that computes the nonlinear response of your ten arc tangent or your radial basis function. You take those outputs, and you hand them to your linear regressor, and that's what you'll be doing in today's lab, for example. But the kernel trick says, you know what, you can skip that, you can skip that step. You don't actually have to compute the function of, the nonlinear function of x, in order to then multiply it by, by itself. You could just try to directly work in z space. So we can try to say, all right, I, if I can come up with some matrix that represents multiplying a z vector by another z vector, I could use that instead of predefining a special family of response functions. So we said, oh, I've got radial, fun radial basis functions. I'm going to choose these offsets and choose these scaling parameters, right? Okay, yeah, that's fine. But you could you could skip that and just go straight to oh, if only I could compute the product of a z a z by another z. So we're going to define a kernel as something that takes a data point xi and a data point xj. Now they're bolded here again, right? They could be some one dimensional or many dimensional, doesn't matter, and it returns a value 
for the dot product of zi transpose zj. The process we've just described does that. It's just that it's very procedural, right? And you have to define your parameters for your nonlinear responses. But we could try doing this in another way. And in this way, you're going to see that we can go into very high dimensional responses. So it's as if we had a very, very long z vector, even infinite dimensional z vector. Right? And so it goes like this. It's going to be one more substitution. You've seen this equation originally with x's in it. Then you saw it with z's just a second ago. And now, instead of, instead of the z's, you're going to see kernel function of x comma x. Or, if it wasn't a big Z and a big Z, it was a little Z and a big Z, then you're going to have a kernel of little x and big x. So, you should be now th saying, what is this magical kernel matrix, this kernel function here, that allows me to do everything without going into my z dimensional space, my basis functions here. All right. And, and a quick note, capital X, sorry, capital K kernel on the big X's is a matrix of dot products where every element in this matrix is given by little k, so that's the whole matrix, right? Little k, this is kernel function, but only taking in two inputs, xi and xj. Right, so that's how we, we can loop through and fill in this kernel matrix by, if I ever told you what K is, I'm getting there, um, then, then you'd be able to compute all the entries in this matrix. Okay. What are we doing? Right. So, example versions of K. We're going to make a K function. It's going to be a linear kernel. It's going to take in two vectors, Xi and Xj, and the computation is xi transpose xj. Right, so this is linear regression. Right? This is the, the example we already saw. We can do degree p polynomial, where we put in xi transpose xj plus 1 to the pth power. Now we have a p polynomial. Interesting, right? We, we're getting this behavior, the same behavior we would have had if we said, oh, I'm going to sit there and compute x, x squared, x cubed, x, da, 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 x to the p, right, and made a long vector. And then with that vector, that z vector, said, oh, now I need to multiply that z vector with other z vectors, right, zi versus zj. But here we're just doing, doing it directly. So, so far you're saying, well, that just seems like a little bit, maybe you're saving a few cycles on the computer. It's not a big deal. Okay, that's fine. But then we get to the radial basis function version of the kernel, where we say kernel ki, kj, and now we're plugging in, again, xi, xj, xi, xj. We still have a lambda parameter, okay, so we didn't, we didn't get away from that. We can still want to maximize that. But now the radial basis function done in this kernel version is equivalent to having an infinite number of basis functions. We're saying there's no offset term here, right? There's just this, this lambda. So we're, we're saying, OK, it doesn't, doesn't, we don't have to enumerate all the different shifts like we had before, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. In fact, this is, this is as if we had an infinite dimensional z. All right, so we're going to focus on that one in particular. If we do the kernel trick with the RBF function, and we have one thing we have to adjust, that's the lambda, right? You can see that if you have a high lambda, then it comes out with a fairly smooth version. It's trying to fit all the data pretty smoothly without, without overfitting too much downside of that is it's, uh, you know, it doesn't go up very high when the data says up. It doesn't go down very low when the data says down. But overall, it, it, you know, maybe it's, it's trying to listen to the trend. If you have a low lambda, lambda equals 0.5, so that was 1.5, now it's 0.5. Uh, now it's trying harder to go through all the data points. But then when there's no data, it says, wow, I really don't know what to do forever. This is a Bayesian formulation, right? So it's 
it's really washed out here. And so if I ask for what is the what is the state of the world at this x, it will say, well, generally it's a very, very, very broad distribution, right? It could be anywhere. And if you choose lambda just right, you could try sweeping lambdas, you could try uh, other non um, nonlinear optimizations, then you'll get this shape, which is supposed to be a little bit better than those two. So this is the best you can get using radial basis functions on this data set. OK. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to say, let's see how much we have. Let's just finish off on fitting variance. Um, we can fit the variance in the same way we said before, that we might have, uh, we might look at our marginal likelihood and say, all right, we figure out our weights phi, our vector of weights phi. We might have a distribution over them, right? And now we're going to try to choose the sigma that maximizes that. And we'll do a search. We could just sample densely along the, the variety of sigmas until we get something that gives us the maximum, maximum likelihood. This is slightly at odds, right? Because I just said, well, you could do that to find the lambdas. So if you're trying to find both the lambdas and the sigmas, the variance here, then you now have to vary two parameters and do a two parameter search. So this is where people uh, will do a nonlinear optimization, but they will alternate between the two parameters in an EM style, style way. OK, I don't think you have to do this in, in today's practical, but you do get to do nonlinear regression. So just like last week, but this time we're going to reverse it. So if you are at the latter half of the alphabet, starting with M. Uh, please go have a snack, and then come join us in Mallet Place Engineering Building. Uh, 1.05 will be available to you. The rest of you uh, come over now, and you'll start upstairs 1.21, where I checked, and it seems to be that the air conditioning is was working. Uh, also, if you're if you're taking a break to go eat and come come back, uh, you know there, there are there were some seats available in the other lab, so maybe you can come back early. Uh, I don't want to promise anything, but um, you know, be, be on the lookout.